Welcome to our study on the book of Romans. This is Sonship Orientation, and today we're going to start session 87. Now, I have a couple of things on the PowerPoint. Ha <laughs> ha, I didn't hook up my remote on the PowerPoint, so I have to do this manually in this session. That's all right. I want to show you something that you probably will not remember. But I told you something way back there. In fact, what I'm about to show you now I told you, oh, almost a year ago. Now, we've covered a lot of ground in the last year. But I want to call your attention to the board. Do you remember what we covered last time? Did y'all watch the DVD? Did you? Okay. Did, um, do you remember when we talked about godly love and how you're going to get you know, you're going to get it in these four decision-making skills. You're going to get two parts here, one here, one here, two here, one more before the end of the chapter. Remember we talked about that godly love coming in six parts. Remember all that? Do you remember that? I want to show you something I wrote in your notes in session 15 and 16. This is almost a year ago you were in this. When God uses the terminology of a man after my own heart, He's not saying, in addition to all those other things that he's not saying, that he's looking for a man who loves me with all his heart. Do you remember when we covered this, a man after God's own heart? Do you remember who we were talking about? David. David, all right. Now, I'm not telling you that an adopted son doesn't love his father. Of course he does. What I'm telling you is that the love a son has for his father is not what either the earthly or heavenly father is looking for in adoption. One of the doctrines that is going to emerge out of all of this, and we really won't get to it for a while, but we'll encounter it before we get out of the book of Romans, is the proper doctrinal understanding of love, especially as it pertains to sonship. I'm talking about godly love and godly charity. And last Sunday, I oriented you to what I talked to you about almost a year ago. What I'm trying to, what, all I'm trying to illustrate to you is, sitting back in those early notes are all kinds of things that alerted you to things that we're actually discussing now. I just wanted you to see the cohesiveness of this study. That this is not meandering off somewhere, but a year ago, that paragraph in yellow had last Sunday's sermon in mind. Do you see what I'm talking about? I want to show you one more. By the way, do you remember what I told you about how all the doctrine had godly thinking, godly living, godly labor in it? And that you were supposed to have a twofold response to that doctrine in order for it to effectually work. Anybody remember what that twofold response was? A positive, and it's got to be somewhere up on the board. A positive response and a proper response. I want to show you what was in lessons 17 and 18 in your notes. And here it is. You don't realize it when you read this, but you will shortly. But when Solomon asks for an understanding heart, he's asking for the highest level of sonship there is, a man of understanding. The terminology is not just casually used here. But then we can also see the failure of a son in Solomon who, because of his own negative and improper response to the sonship education allowed himself to be victimized by the policy of evil. I knew you didn't realize it, but when we talked about those two issues last week, I told you, I showed you in Solomon those exact same issues almost a year ago. Now, what am I doing by showing you this? I'm trying to connect it all up and show you sitting way back in your notes is terminology. We didn't talk about it back there because it was so early on in sonship. But those terms, negative and improper, were not just terms that were pulled out of the air. They are terms that I knew were later going to come into play when we got to this place. And guess what? If you forget about last Sunday's sermon, 
when we get back over to the doctrine in Romans 12 to 16, you're going to be then faced with that positive and proper response again as you go through that doctrine. Did everybody see how that connected up? I just thought that was a good thing. Y'all are all looking like, you know, I, you know, spilled your icy or something. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. I didn't realize I was going to bum y'all out so badly. I just, okay. And we've been talking about things that are be, going to be happening. And, and w one of the things we've been looking at is what's going to be happening in the dispensation of the fullness of times. Ephesians 1.10 a verse that you're going to get very familiar with. Why are we discussing that? Because it's in the book of Ephesians that you get introduced to phase one of your level two education when you get subtlety added to those four decision-making skills that made you a simple son. So when you get subtlety added, as, you're, as that's being done in the book of Ephesians, you find out that <clears throat> there are some things though, as talk, that's going to be done in the dispensation of the fullness of times. And since we've been talking about the creature, we've been talking about what some of those things are. And you know, and we've discussed it, that part of what you're going to be doing is having the heaven now be able to respond to itself the way a, all the parts of a body work together as a single unit. And you'll no longer look up when you look up, and that's one of the things that you're thinking has to change about, when you look up into the sky at night, you shouldn't just be looking at a bunch of different stars or even just a single constellation, but you're going to begin to get information now that's going to allow you to look at that as one single body made up of a lot of parts. Just like you look at, you know, you look at anyone that comes in the door here, uh, you know, when Bud and Nancy walked in the door, I, I see them, I instantly recognize who that is, I'm, but I'm just looking at them, you know, each one, I'm just looking at them, boom, I mean, that's just, you, you know what I'm saying? I'm not looking and going, oh, there's a, there's a finger, there's an arm, there's an ear, there, you know, I'm just seeing the whole collective. You're going to be looking at the creature the same way. Now, we've been looking at this overview of what subtlety does for us. And we've been talking about two major things. The first thing about subtlety is it is going to allow you, give you the acuteness to discern the finer points of your Heavenly Father's business and your part in it. And that's part of what we've been covering. But the second major thing it does is it gives you an acuteness into the policy of evil so that you're going to be able to see behind that clever, deceptive attempt by Satan to get you off track. Now, we're going to come back to that subtlety and we're going to finish this up today because we've been and, and looking at the Father's business and, and our part in it. The truth is, there are only two entities that know how to deliver that creature from the bondage of corruption. And that's God and an educated son. Those are the only ones that have the ability to do that. Israel's doctrine does not equip them to be able to do that. And no man without the sonship education will be able to get that done. And that can only be gained through the curriculum that's contained in the Word of God. Okay, now there's a couple things I want to show you. And I'm going to take you to a verse. And I want to, you've got a timeline in your notes and you'll look. It starts with the dispensation of grace. That's not dog. Okay, the tribulation restitution of all things, dispensation of fullness of times, and the ages to come. What I want to do is I want to show you that the difference between a couple of these that we haven't ever discussed too much. First of all, let's go to the restitution of all things. And here's the verse I want to take you to. And this is going to be Acts 3.19. Peter is preaching, remember, after the death, burial, resurrection, and even ascension of Jesus Christ, in the extension of mercy to Israel to give them another opportunity to repent and change their mind about Jesus being the Messiah. In Acts 3, he says, Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out 
when the times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. You know from this verse that Israel gets her sins blotted out when? And when do the times of refreshing come? Right, not until the presence of the Lord shows up. So we know it won't be until after the second advent. Because that's when they get the new covenant applied to them. Remember, I'll forgive their sins and remember, forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. So that's when that gets applied. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. And here's what we have. The times of restitution of all things is what's going to take place in the millennial kingdom. Did you ever ask yourself this question? Why in the world does God establish His kingdom and Jesus sits on the throne, all that good stuff happens, only to have another rebellion at the end and a last great battle and a great white throne? Why not just end it all here? Did you ever wonder about that? Why that interruption? Well, there's, it's because, there's uh, two major reasons for that. Number one is, just because the Antichrist gets thrown into, the, uh, into hell and, the, and, and Satan gets thrown into the bottomless pit, doesn't mean that's the end of everything that's rebellious on this earth. The millennium is going to weed them out. That's the first thing you know. The second thing is, some things have to be restored. And this is the time period in which that's going to happen. The times of restitution of all things. Now, for Israel, there's going to be some things that are going to be restored down here on earth. But in the heavenly places, remember, it's not just the times of the restitution of the earth, it's all things. So we're going to be restoring some things in the heavenly places. That's what I want to talk to you about today. What is it that you're going to be restored? What is it that's got to take place in order for you to get, to get that done? In fact, well, we'll, well I, that's not exactly accurate terminology, but we'll straighten that out as we kind of go through the study here. Um, so there are some things. By the way, can someone tell me what is it on this earth that's going to have to be... Something's going to get dismantled on this earth. Anybody want to tell me what that is? Something that has been put into place by the adversary is going to be dismantled on this earth. I'm not going to show you the, the verses on it today. I probably should have included it, but I didn't. If he's gone, if he's gone, we have a tendency to think, okay, if he's gone, then, then everything should be okay, right? But is everything okay? In the millennium, does anybody hate Christ? Mm -hmm. Do they end up rebelling against Him at the end? Oh yeah, a multitude. So what's going on? Something has, something has to be dismantled. Oh, that's really good, but I'm looking for... Uh, you, you know the title of it. He said, the empire he created. That's really good thinking, but give it a name we're all familiar with. No, no, that's a vehicle for it. You actually got two parts to this thing. Are you, the, did someone say the policy of evil? Policy of evil. Course of this world. Don't those have to be dismantled? Remember the course of this world, he set into motion and it doesn't need him sitting in the driver's seat. It just goes. And he has also put into place a policy of evil. Is that policy of evil at work? Mm -hmm. Well, see, Satan can't be everywhere, right? Is the policy of evil at work in Monaghan's? Yes. Is it at work in Odessa? Yes. Work in Midland? Yes. Well, guess what? Once you get that thing rolling, you've got two things. You've got the course of this world, and you've got the policy of evil, and those things have to get dismantled. And that's what's going to be happening right here. But the policy of evil is not restricted to just this earth. Where else? 
That's right, in the heavenly places. That means there's some things that have to get dismantled that Satan did in the heavenly places, and you're going to be directly involved in that. A couple of weeks ago, Randy said, do we get to blow stuff up? And I said, you do. And that is going to, in fact, in fact, today, I'm going to show you where, when you can go out and look at the heavens tonight, and you're going to look at that, and you're going to be able to say, I'm going to go with Randy up there, and we're going to blow that up. <laughs> and you're going to know exactly where you're going to go and do that. I'm going to show it to you. This is going to be a remarkable thing. By the way, if you don't know where you're supposed to go, how will you... You know, if someone says, hey, I need you to go do a job, and it's in Mississippi... You know what the first thing you're going to ask is? Where? Where? That's right. Whenever I say there's some things that have to be dismantled in the heavenly places, the thing that ought to be in your mind, and probably is, is where in the heavenly places? And I'm going to show you that. By the way, this didn't get revealed until after the flood. But I'll show you about that too. Okay. Now, there's two ways that we've been taught to look at this at this. this uh, we'll call it the body of the creature because that's what we've been, or the creature. Well, there's two ways we've been taught to look at that. And I don't know if I have them up here. I, I don't guess I do. So, oh, well, let's do this. Number one, we're taught to look at it as a creature. Number two, that's right, a building or a structure. And I like the building word. That, that, that's the two ways you're going to look at it. And when you get into the book of Romans, the first way you're introduced to it is as a creature because these decision-making skills that you're going to learn in the book of Romans are really going to allow you to deal with that place as a living creature. And so that's the first way you're taught about it. But you know as well as I do, if you go out at night and you look up there, there's nothing up there that suggests a living creature. And that's because of the things that have been done not just by the adversary, but by God in making a separation between the earth and the heaven. And secondly, by putting the creature in a state of, now we've described it this way, a state of paralysis. It just, huh? Suspended animation. Suspended animation. He's, he's in cold storage. He just, he can't, you know, he can't respond to himself up there. But that's all going to be changed. Now, the architectural, uh, architectural structure is a little easier to see. We're going to talk about that too. But we've got skill sets that are going to require us to be able to see that creature in both of those ways. Now, remember, since we're talking about subtlety, what books do you know we're in? Ephesians, Ephesians Philippians, and Colossians. When we get over there, you're going to see that why there's those three, and you'll understand more about that, so I don't want to explain that today. But what I want to do is show you that when you get over there, here you're talked about it at the creature. Remember all that was in Romans 8? For the creature groaneth and waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. Remember all that, the creature? But then when you get to Ephesians and you get subtly, then it's going to change from the creature to now as a building or as a structure. And I want to, I just... I'm not trying to teach you this passage. I just want you to notice the terminology that's being used here. Look with me in Ephesians 2.19. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built, and I've just highlighted these so you can see it, upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, you see, this is all building terminology in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, when we get over to Ephesians, we'll talk about this passage. Right now, I'm not, I don't want you to try to figure out the doctrine I just want you to notice all this building terminology. And in the first of it, if you go back and look, he's saying, well, he's kind of making an analogy. He's saying the apostles and the prophets are the foundation. By the way, that's not the apostles of Jesus and the Old Testament prophets. You understand who those are, right? 
take you back three years to our study in the Bible, before the canon of Scripture was completed, you remember you've got Paul interrupting and now you know what's happening. There had to be someone in the local assembly that could identify infallible Scripture from that which was not. And then you had those that were responsible for copying that Scripture and getting it out to the rest of the churches. And that was the job of the apostles and prophets. People that don't rightly divide the Word don't understand that the Word means uh, an apostle doesn't always mean just the twelve that walked with Jesus. Was Paul an apostle? Yes. Were there some other apostles that he names in the Scripture? Yes. And when he talks to the Corinthians, you remember, he is talking about, he's talking about those jobs that they've got. So when he talks about the apostles and prophets, you're reading in Ephesians 2, you know what he's talking about here. A foundation of the, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. How is Jesus the chief cornerstone? It, that's a building term, right? But how is Jesus the chief cornerstone? Huh? He's the head? What do you... Death, that, that, all that's true, but think about the building terminology and, and the context here. If the apostles and prophets were identifying Paul's writings as inspired scripture and copying them and getting them out, why in the world would Paul come along and say, Jesus, if they're the foundation, Jesus is the chief cornerstone? Because it was based on what he told Paul. Right. You see? It's all. And why is he saying that? Because there are people today that will hear rightly dividing and they will reject it. And let me tell you why. All they have to, they'll be on board until you get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And when they hear me say, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is for Israel and their program and not for the church, the body of Christ, that just torques that bolt one turn too tight for them. And they can't deal with that. And they feel like... If they're not going to do what Jesus said and did in the Gospels, they're somehow betraying Him. And that statement about Jesus being the chief cornerstone is the reminder that Paul is saying this whole doctrine came from Jesus Christ. It's just the doctrine for the body of Christ, where the Gospels was the doctrine for the believing remnant. You see? So we're not being disloyal to Jesus. We're just rightly dividing the word. But people can't get over that. So, so okay. Now, there's another thing about building. And I've used a couple of illustrations in your notes. One of those is the church. When, when I talk about the church met together, you know what I'm talking about. Us. The individual members that make up this corporate body of believers. But we also, when you got ready to come here today, you would think, well, we're going to church. And now you're thinking of a physical building. And do you know what? It is. That w now, when you get into the heavenly places, give me a single word. I, I know this is very general and very basic. And it is not at all encompassing everything you're going to do. Give me a single word of what you're going to constitute a part of in the heavenly places. What is it you'll be doing up there? I'm not talking about individual things you'll be doing. I'm just saying corporately, we're going to be doing what? The body of Christ is meant to do what in the heavenly places? I, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Inte well, inte that's true. What'd you say, Clifford? We are going to be restoring. But let's think further than that. Let's go out to our vocation where everything has gotten put back right. The dispensation fullness of times is over. And now we're going to do what we're going to do in eternity you're actually going to sit where? In heavenly places. Describe for me the different elements of what you'll be sitting in. Government. That's the word I'm after. You're going to be part of a government. Now, don't get to thinking that's all there is to it. It's way not. But if you say, okay, I'm going to be part of a government up there, think of our government. You have a Congress 
You know what that's made of? Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> I asked the Senate. Okay, I asked some political science majors. All right. You've got people that have been elected that make up a, a assembly of, of government that we call a Congress. But you can also drive up there and see a physical building that people look at and go, that's Congress. And guess what? They sit in that building to carry on what it is they're doing, right? So, well, okay, they're supposed to. Okay. Now, here's the deal. That word Congress can ap apply to the living members and apply to the building. I know that's a pretty crummy illustration, but there's the creature. It's a living organism, and it's a building. And you say, which is it? It's both at the exact same time. Okay, now, I just want to establish that, and, because, and by the way, that gets all delineated out through principalities and powers and thrones and mights and dominions and all that, just like any government is broken up into, into sections like that. Okay, so we're going to bring function. Somebody mentioned that a while ago, life or, or intellect, intellect to the creature. We're going to bring all of that. We're going to give the creature the intellect it's supposed to have. We're going to bring it the life it's supposed to, to be. We're going to administrate a government up there. I just want to say one more time before we move on, don't get to thinking that every day in eternity, all you're going to do is come to your office in the heavenly places and sit in a chair and just make decisions like congressmen okay don't get to thinking that's all there is to it because what you're going to learn about when you get to phase two of level two is that there is an aspect of your relationship with your heavenly father that is going to take you way beyond anything you thought about before. I don't want to say anything more about that because that's what I'm going to talk to you about next week. This is something we have never, ever discussed. And it is one of those things that when you see it, it is unbelievably marvelous. But it takes this thing further than you, than you would have thought. But, again, and that's that thing I can't break it up. Remember, I told you I would only do that if I could get it all done in one sitting because I don't want to break that up. Okay. Now, um, let's see. I'm going to take you over to Job 38. Um, as we go to Job 38, I want you to have this thing in mind again about the structure. And I think we can get through this pretty quickly. Um, but... God's going to talk about the heavenly places as an architectural structure. And I want you to get one thing firm in your mind. When your Bible talks about windows and doors and pillars and cornerstones and foundations and all those kinds of issues, those things really are out there. They are not language of accommodation or anthropopathisms. There's two big words, anthropomorphism, anthropopathism. When you go to school, you learn all these big 50 cent words and then you use them to impress everybody. But the point of all this is, th is this. And anthropomorphism is when the Bible says that God's ear is not, you know, where he cannot hear and his hand is not short that he cannot say. But they say that Bible doesn't mean God has an ear or he has a hand. They're just using that to illustrate. Or, so, or when you see the windows of heaven were open, they'll say, it's not really windows. That's an anthropopathism. And it just means that it's giving you a picture so you'll understand. I'm going to tell you those are not true. I'm going to tell you we're supposed to see this exactly that way. And you say, well, then you think there really is windows in, the, in heaven. Yes. And you think there are doors. Yes. And you think there's a foundation. Yes. And pillars. Yes. I believe there's all of that. And you'll see why. So 
we're, we're going to, and by the way, when we get to Job 38, you have to remember where you are. Job has been helped out by his three buddies. Remember, he lost everything. Lost his kids, lost his herds, lost his wealth, and his wife, being the helpmeet she was, said, why don't you curse God and die? Well, thank you, honey. Okay. So he's pretty much on his own, and his three friends come over, and you know what they basically say to him in a nutshell? You're hiding some kind of sin, and that's why God's punishing you. Thank you, buddies, for that. Now God is going to ask Job some questions. And he's going to ask these questions to get Job's thinking turned in the right direction. In fact, he's going to make a reference to what his three buddies said. He's going to talk about that they are darkening counsel with words without wisdom. That's God's description of his buddies' advice. If you darken counsel, do you know what you're doing? You're making it worse, aren't you? You're really just throwing everything into the dark where nobody can understand anything. That's what these guys were doing. But when, when God asked Job these questions, the thing I need you to understand is, Job, he's not asking from a standpoint of, I'm God and you're not, and I know stuff you don't know. He's asking Job questions about things Job knows some things about, so that he can get Job's thinking going in a different way. Now, let's read this and we'll see. Job 38.1 Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsel by words without wisdom? And that's exactly what Satan will do in his policy of evil with us today. He will send you darkened counsel of words without wisdom for the purpose of getting you thinking the wrong way. And you realize godly thinking is the first aspect of what you're supposed to have. Now, verse 4. Where was thou when I... Oh, let me just give you the... I'm sorry, I'm just reading it and I should be putting it up here. Uh, Job 38, 4. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Most folks would look at that and say, that's just a laugh, the earth doesn't have foundations. The Bible says it does. Not an anthropopathism. It really does have foundations. Maybe we'll talk about that more later. Declare if thou hast understanding. Now the question is not, do you know the earth has foundations? God's assuming he knows that. He says, where were you? Where was Job? He wasn't even around, was he? God's making a point here. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? When he says the measures of the earth, what's God talking about? He didn't talk about how big it is. You're going to measure something out. You know what that means? God measured this planet out to be the exact size that it is. Not only that, or who has stretched the line upon it? Do you know what you're doing when you're stretching a line? That's, that's construction terminology. You're measuring and you're stretching a line on it. Whereupon are the foundations that are fastened? Go back up to that, that uh, verse 4. He says, it had foundations, and then he says, where are they fastened? So, you, I'm, I'm not just showing you building terminology here. I'm showing you the way to... Or, who laid the cornerstone thereof? Well, that's ridiculous. The earth is a sphere. It doesn't have a cornerstone. Well, that would be the statement that a man makes who doesn't understand how God built this earth. But do you know what? You're going, to be, you're going to be educated in understanding what your Heavenly Father understands about this. And it's going to go way beyond what men understand. Now, we're going to go back just while well, we looked at that, so I just flip you through this and let's get up to verse 8. I was going to take you back to 4. But I tell you what, let's take this up in the middle. Verse 6, Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened, or who laid the cornerstone thereof, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. At the creation, all of the angels rejoiced. Listen to me carefully, including Lucifer. They saw God doing something, 
and it caused their heart to rejoice. Now, verse 8. Or who shut up the sea with doors when it broke forth as if it had issued out of the womb? Out of whose womb came the ice and the hoary frost of heaven? Who hath gendered it? The water 